What up, HyperChange? Welcome to another episode. It's the moment we've been waiting for. Rivian has released their IPO S1 filing, uh, the document that goes through all of their business, all their plans, all their financials ahead of their anticipated IPO. This is one of the hottest expected IPOs of the year. Um, Bloomberg reported they were estimating to do it at about $80 billion. So they're trying to IPO this uh, company with $80 billion despite just have basically zero revenue up until this point, just starting production. Um, it's almost an unprecedented valuation for uh, a company at this stage, um, but you know, huge investment. They're losing a ton of money. They have like 8,000 employees. Um, I don't know. This is just a really interesting case study to follow. Many people are looking at Rivian as the number two EV player behind Tesla, although I would say they're at least a decade behind, but people are taking them seriously. They're hiring great talent. They have these amazing products in their own niche, the electric adventure vehicles, um, electric pickup, electric SUV, kind of built for off-roading, adventuring, a little bit different than Tesla segment. So um, awesome to see that electric vehicles are gaining steam moving forward, um, but really curious to see how this IPO works because my first First take on this is incredibly overvalued. Like Rivian has huge potential as a company, but I just like how are they going to live up to the hype, the valuation? There's so many expectations here. Um, they're just getting to the hard part. You know, a prototype. I call it the honeymoon phase of the EV. Like they show this prototype, everyone's like, "Wow, this is so cool!" Um, and they get pre-orders for you know a fully refundable deposit. But then now the hard part comes. You have to you know meet these customer needs. You have to deliver a car that blows them away. You have to uh, hit those financial milestones. You know, so much goes into the manufacturing ramp. This is why. I'll Almost every single automotive startup in the history of the country has failed except for Tesla to get to profitability and to get the scale because it's just such a hard business. And I think many people give Rivian the benefit of the doubt because of Tesla's success. Um, and so, I don't know. Anyway, I went through their S1 filing. I'll put a link below. Um, and I w highlighted all the parts that I think were super interesting, all the little tidbits and nuggets um, that I, you know, I've been waiting for. So let's just roll. Let's start with this. 48,390 pre-orders for the R1T and the R1S. We got the official number here. This is how many pre-orders, and these are for a $1,000 fully refundable deposit. So um, honestly, not bad. I would say this is about in line with expectations, but if you're buying a company of $80 billion, I mean, they need to sell hundreds of thousands, millions of cars um, to really fulfill in that valuation and give you upside. So 48,000 pre-orders with a fully refundable deposit, I mean, it's gonna take them a while to hit that kind of production, so they will be uh, you know, production constrained for a while, but anyway, that's the number we're looking at there. They also here uh, clarify that they started customer deliveries of the vehicle in September, that's the pickup truck, and they plan to commence customer deliveries of the R1S in December. So a really interesting timing for Rivina IPO right now. I mean, uh, they haven't really delivered any customer cars except for a handful of them. They're just about to start production, so they have no revenue. It's like a pre-revenue company when we look at the financials right now, and they're just getting to these initial customer deliveries. So very critical, uh, extremely critical moment for the company. Um, now let's talk about um, the financials. So these are the annual financials here. Um, and this is really interesting because we had no idea what Rivian's financials were up until this point. All we knew is they're probably losing a bunch of money because they're building all these factories and all that sort of stuff, et cetera. Um, but loss from operations, 409 million in 2019, over a billion dollars in 2020. Um, and then the first six months of this year, they've lost about a billion dollars versus 400 million um, in 2020. So their loss is more than doubling year over year. Um, I'm also gonna break this down on a quarterly basis for you right now, which as you can see, I made this cool little chart, right? Um, they lost about almost $600 million in a quarter. This is frankly way above what I was expecting. Um, I mean, their, their spending is insane. Okay, like l let's just get a flavor of what Tesla is doing here going on hyper charts. We also added Rivian to hyper charts. I mean, this to me is crazy. Tesla's only spending about 1.6 billion a quarter um, on their operating expenses, according to hyper charts here. Rivian already spending a huge fraction of that. I remember Tesla's delivering, um, as of Q2, you know, almost 800,000 cars a year, more, 850, 900,000 cars a year, almost a million car a year run rate. Um, Rivian, in the same position here, is losing about 600 million a quarter without delivering a single car. And so Rivian's loss is almost, you know, two thirds half of what Tesla is spending per quarter um, operationally, um, yet they're not delivering vehicles. So what I'm trying to get at here is the cost structure of Rivian is extremely bloated. Um, and this is something that I've, th this is kind of my biggest critique of Rivian, that they had so much money flowing into them. Everybody wants to invest in the next Tesla. Um, everyone's begging to get on their cap table. Amazon's throwing them billions. Ford's throwing them billions. Um, and then you kind of get lazy. Like they're hiring all these people. They haven't done any hard work. They've unveiled one prototype, spent billions of dollars on it, hiring all these people with unlimited salaries or an, an unlimited budget. They haven't 
ever had to be lean. They haven't, uh, so I just think there's a big moment of reckoning here where I think Rivian has too much fat and they're gonna have to trim that down dramatically if they wanna succeed in the long term as a company. That's a normal thing. Tesla had a bunch of uh, cutbacks. Um, every single company that has to scale to profitability after getting kind of this honeymoon startup phase is gonna have to make these intense cuts. So the first thing I would notice about Rivian is the expenditures are way more than I would have expected I was expecting to be like 600 million a year at this stage, not 600 million a quarter. Um, and this is only gonna grow from here. I mean, you can see this ramping quickly to over a billion dollar loss a quarter um, in the near term. And now we'll talk about how much cash they have um, on the balance sheet in a little bit. Um, this was an interesting uh, tidbit here on the, the capacity of Rivian, their first factory, which they're spending right now is 150,000 units annually. Um, and I already heard rumors that they're building another factory, which is interesting, because it's like, you only have 48,000 pre-orders. This factory has a capacity of 150,000 and like, why are you already spending money on another factory? Um, I think that's a little bit premature, especially knowing that you're gonna learn so much about um, how to do production. You're gonna fail building that first factory, then you wanna wait to build your second factory to use all those learnings. Um, so anyway. Um, they also say here, really interesting tidbit, they have no financial projections in this entire model, which I thought was super unique and interesting, but they say they do plan to deliver 100,000 electric delivery vehicles to Amazon. So there's this big partnership with Amazon, they become an investor. Amazon has exclusive rights by this EDV electric delivery van product from Rivian, uh, which is really cool. I spotted one in the wild in Seattle. Like, awesome to see that Amazon is going sustainable and going green, um, but Amazon is like, really rigged the contract in their favor. I would say like you have to, Rivian is only allowed to deliver these electric delivery vans to Amazon. They have right of first refusal. They can basically say, nah, we don't want it. Um, and so, but that's what you'd expect with the power dynamics of Rivian and Amazon there. But here's the tidbit is they want to deliver 100,000 EDVs to Amazon by 2025. So it's the closest thing we got to a projection in this entire document. Cash flow. This is interesting. So we saw the operating loss about 600 million a quarter, but that's not exactly how much cash is coming out of the company's bank. So for the cash flow situation, um, we are looking at uh, for the our year ending, they burn about um, 353 million in operating activities, 199 million in investing activities. I think you know operating the business and then capex for future uh, production capacity. So you know about 500. Uh, 550 million dollars in 2019 that was burned by the company. Then that ramped significantly to about 1.7 billion if you combine those for 2020. Um, and then in the first six months of this year, we're at like 1.7, a little over 1.7 billion dollars burn in just the first six months of 2020, uh, 2021 before we even enter production. And so Rivian, how much cash they have on the balance sheet? As of June, it was 3.7 billion. So. Rivian right now, my guess is burning about 900, almost burning a billion a quarter. So at 3.7 billion of cash on hand, they have cash for less than four quarters of growth. So that's why they're doing an IPO. Um, they're gonna try and raise billions and billions of dollars um, in this IPO to give them runway. Um, but the point is here, you're looking, this isn't like software. I think people forget about that. Like this isn't a really great business model. You have to build the car and deliver it to a customer. It's a, it's a real item that you have to deliver. Um, and the margins are horrible. And it takes billions and billions of dollars of spending up front on the factory before you can even start seeing any return from that. I think this gets down to the crux of if you're investing in Rivian, you need to be assuming that they can continue to raise capital and you know maybe they'll raise 10 billion in the IPO they're gonna need to raise another 10 15 billion probably to get to profitability at the rate they're spending um, from the capital markets and so for this entire flywheel to work Rivian has to continually have investors believing in its perceived solvency they have to believe that Rivian's executing that they're doing great they're gonna have to keep selling stock to fund the business and that's what they've done in the past and so if they can't do that if expectations crumble if people are like wait you know all this bad news comes uh, you know Rivian has a recall, something bad, they get a bad review, the stock starts crashing, they are relying on that stock price to raise money to actually succeed in the business model. So this is where investing revenue is super duper risky, especially at this extremely high valuation because what's your upside? You don't have much upside, um, but your downside's huge because the second they stumble, the stock price stumbles, they have to try and raise market. It's called like this downward death spiral where your stock price is crumbling, then everyone knows you have to sell more stock to keep your business afloat. So your stock price is crumbling more, et cetera, et cetera. Employees who all have their stock options that are at this incredibly high level are all gonna be underwater on their stock options. Company morale sinks at the hardest moment when you have to step up, ramp manufacturing, put in all that work. That's exactly when the hope dwindles and your employees lose confidence. So I'm seeing this potentially perfect storm of things that could hit Rivian um, because the valuation is too high and because they are gonna have to rely on raising billions and billions more dollars from the capital market. So that is the biggest risk, I would say, if you're investing in Rivian, this company doesn't make money, they're gonna have to keep raising billions and billions of dollars from the equity markets. And I mean, it makes sense. The scope of what they're investing in is huge. Like they're basically trying to build out Tesla. 
It's taken Tesla like 15 years to build out what they have now. They spent billions and billions of dollars. Um, so Rivian, as of September 2021, they operated six service centers in four states, 11 mobile service vehicles, 2747 support. And they already have 145 Rivian Waypoint charging sites in 30 states and 20 service centers for further expansion. And they go into more detail here, but the point is they're building the charging, they're building the service, they're building the service vans. Like they have so much infrastructure that they need to spend on to be an electric vehicle brand. And that's what you should be thinking. If you're a Rivian customer, like Tesla is the supercharged network. It works, it's great. They have mobile service, like they're in every city, like they've been around, like people know Tesla and they know that they're gonna get help. Um, when you're buying a new vehicle brand, like all of that's in question and they're gonna have to build this from the ground up. So that's why what Rivian's doing is an incredibly uh, ambitious endeavor. Now this is the most one of the most interesting tidbits um, is the software component. So when they talk about the LTR, uh, like lifetime revenue opportunities of their products, a big part of that is software, and they have all these other things like um, you know service, insurance, and we'll get to that. But this is the one that's got, been getting a little bit of press too. Is they want to have an autonomous driving capability of ten thousand dollars, basically just like Tesla's FSD um, that they're planning to charge uh, customers for. So if you're a Rivian customer, I don't know. This is pretty exciting that they are working on autonomous. I mean, they're planning to offer that, but I don't know. It's going to be an uphill battle uh, versus Tesla, but I did think this was a very interesting nugget. And building on that autonomous uh, vehicle capabilities, they say that their R1 vehicles are going to have 12, 11 cameras, 12 sensors, 5 radars, and high-precision GPS antenna, which work together with our purpose-built algorithms to analyze the environment. So this is how they're planning to get these autonomous features out there, equipped with way more sensors and cameras than a Tesla, um, which I think is interesting, maybe higher cost, but maybe that's better, I don't know. Um, and I thought it was a little bit different, interesting that they have um, their electric delivery vans have a slightly different um, camera and sensor set up with 12 cameras and 16 sensors. So another tidbit here, they believe they're gonna be able to increase the annual co production capacity of the normal facility up to 200,000 vehicles um, per year by 2023 as they introduce additional R1 platform variants and expand the facility. So um, yeah, and it, this is actually another thing I wanted to get to is what is Rivian gonna build? And this is what I put in my last episode um, about the Rivian IPO. If you're buying the stock at Rivian, I believe the success of the R1T, that pickup truck, the R1S, the SUV, and the electric delivery van is priced in. You're basically assuming Rivian's gonna be able to deliver hundreds of thousands of units of those cars that they haven't delivered any of. That's a given if you're buying it at that valuation. That's just such a critical piece of investing. Like, what are the, like, you're not just buying into Rivian, okay, if they do well, it's gonna do well. And they're like, what expectations are priced into the equity at this price? And it's hundreds of thousands of deliveries. So to me, if you're buying Rivian at today's price, you're either investing in a huge autonomous program where they can figure out autonomy, they can have these delivery vans driving around, uh, be a huge network and partner for Amazon, maybe that's how they make a ton of money, or there's cheaper versions, a cheaper pickup truck, or this R2R. I found another leaked article um, about the R2R product, which is sort of this quirky off-road rally car kind of like a Subaru, honestly really like a Model Y competitor um, that I think would be a little bit cheaper. I think this is the car that takes Rivian from an $80 billion company to a $150 billion company and you could double your money or so um, is the success of this rally car selling a million units and two million units a year. Um, but that car doesn't exist. They won't even confirm its existence. I couldn't even find its existence in the S1 filing. Um, they just say other variants of the platform, but there is this scoop here and RJ did mention it in like 2018. So this is what I think is the biggest question for Rivian is, R1T has to succeed, R1S has to succeed, and then what's up with this next car? When are we gonna get more details on it? When's it gonna launch? But I feel like I'm getting ahead of myself there because it's like, they haven't even launched the first two cars. So um, here's another tidbit about the waypoints, which is the Rivian sort of supercharger competitor. They plan to deploy 10,000 Rivian waypoints across the US and Canada. So that's another big thing they're spending money on, but they're gonna basically be able to link their own supercharger network. Um, oh, here's where some specs on the, the delivery vans for Amazon. I thought this was pretty interesting. Um, the quality is horrible on the S1 of these graphics, sorry. But um, I thought this was funny. Only up to 120 miles of range for the longer one, 150 for the other ones. I thought those specs were kind of weak, right? Like, and even their R1T and R1S are like 300 miles of range for like 70 grand. Like the Cybertruck for 70 grand is apparently getting 500 plus miles of range. So if the Cybertruck is able to come on a market for the same price with insanely better specs, and you're thinking about Rivian, it's like you're off road, you're out there camping, like wouldn't you want a bunch of range? Like wouldn't you want way extra range because like there might not be a charger? Maybe there's Rivian waypoints everywhere, but I think it's interesting that we're gonna start to see 
um, their battery technology compared to Tesla and we see the cost. Not only are they not able to deliver great specs for their, their range, for their price, but are they making money on those specs? Is the battery pack costing them you know, all this money even with those weak specs? I don't know, we're gonna have to figure it out, but I was kind of unimpressed with these numbers. But there is a, a silver lining here, which is if you're doing a delivery van route, you know exactly how far it's gonna go. Um, you know the route it's running, you know how many miles it needs to go, you know when you can set up the chargers conveniently, so it doesn't necessarily need to be super long range, it just has to have enough to get the route done. So they have Rivian Insurance they're basically gonna launch. And at first I thought this could be a major hiccup because I was like, well, what you're insuring a vehicle that's never existed. What if there's a huge problem with the vehicle and Rivian's on the hook for the insurance for that vehicle? I don't know, I just think that can be messy, but the future is more and more autonomous driving. You get so much data um, on the vehicle and also insurance companies typically are like screwing over, like if you're a Tesla owner and maybe you experience this, like they give you a really, really bad rate um, just because it's a newer vehicle and they don't get it, I guess. Um, but so Rivian, just like Tesla's trying to launch their own insurance, is trying to launch their own insurance as well. But I thought it was interesting that we have established our own insurance agency and digital interface, but they're partnering with other insurance companies to actually make it all happen. Another kind of cool part uh, of this uh, S1 and IPO filing process is they're starting this thing called the Forever Fund, um, where they're basically donating 1% of their stock um, after the offering, which could be $800 million, I guess, worth of Rivian stock. We'll see how that does, right? But um, to this Forever Fund, um, which will kind of be like, uh, you know, a philanthropic uh, organization to give back. And so, I don't know, I thought that was kind of cool and just a little interesting tidbit, 1% of the company to, to this like charity, basically. And then in terms of the executive team, one interesting thing I wanted to point out the board of directors, which I thought was dope, they have Rose Marcario. Um, and so she's actually the CEO of Patagonia for seven years. And I think Patagonia is like the dopest, perfect, brand for Rivian to partner with and take cues from and learn from. So I think she's a huge asset for Rivian. I mean, they're outdoorsy, they're sustainable. Um, I think they just came out with this really cool like sustainable jacket that was made from like all of like re recycled fishnets or something. But anyway, Patagonia is an amazing company and brand. And so I think it's interesting to see that they have um, that sort of talent on their board of directors level. But does that mean much? Not really. The other interesting thing here, executive compensation. So key bono, what are the incentives for your CEO and your leadership. So unlike Elon Musk who takes zero salary, RJ Scringe takes a 650 grand salary, which I think is pretty insane. And he does probably own 15 to 20% of Rivian. So that's already worth, you know, 10, $15 billion, whatever, if they IPO for 80 billion. So he's getting paid 650 grand a year in cash with a 650 grand cash bonus. I mean, that's pretty insane if you ask me. Um, so I don't know, I just thought that was an interesting tidbit, you know, that the CFO is making 400 grand, um, the growth officer is making 400 grand too, like really, really high salaries across the board. Like I almost think they should, Rivian needs to fire half their people and cut all of their salaries in half to be competitive. Um, but we'll just let that play out in the market. Like we'll see if investors give them leeway to keep spending this kind of money on their executive team who so far hasn't really executed on much. Um, and this is another interesting tidbit, was all the sort of history of the price per shares in different um, funding rounds. You know, five bucks per share in February 2019, then 7.59 per share in May 2019, et cetera, et cetera, with the most recent round being like 37 bucks per share um, with the January 2021 financing. And if you'll see, the biggest investor um, putting in an aggregate purchase price there at the bottom of $1.3 billion um, in the Series A preferred, D, E, and F preferred. It looks like Amazon participated in four different rounds. They have four different types of stock um, for $1.4 billion. And so Amazon is a huge investor in Rivian. Um, and I'm gonna give you all my little tidbit moonshot about how I think this could all play out. Um, I think what's gonna happen here, um, I'm like, am I done with the, okay, I'm pretty much done with analyzing the tidbits from the S1, but this is how I think this plays out. Rivian's gonna IPO, a lot of hype, a lot of fanfare. Frankly, I'm not even confident they'll hit 80 billion because I think a lot of people are skeptical about the same stuff I am. Like, this is dope, but is the valuation good? You're spending too much money, like, et cetera, et cetera. But what I think is gonna happen is they'll have an IPO, they'll have a pop, retail investors will get in, I don't wanna say screwed, but like, I don't know, all these VCs and investors like T. Rowe Price has put in $2.2 .2 billion in them. Like they're just all of these funds, late stage growth VC funds that are gonna to wanna to cash out as soon as they can. They're gonna to sell to retail investors. So what I think is gonna happen is Rivian's gonna IPO for like 80 billion and then it might do well for a month or two and then slowly as the lockup expire and these early investors are allowed to sell and as the company's financials aren't great, they're burning all this money, um, all the press comes out about how much money they're losing. I think the stock and valuation will normalize, frankly, to you know 40 billion, 30 billion, 20 billion um, and the stock's gonna go down 
and this will be like six months to a year after the IPO, as the hard part sets in of ramping production. And I think this is why they're really smart not to give any projections on how many deliveries and stuff they're gonna give because they don't know. And I think uh, Tesla actually shot themselves in the foot by making all these delivery projections and then not hitting them. So I think it was kind of interesting and genius that Rivian didn't put in um, any projections. Then what I think happens is the IPO, Amazon, who owns 5% of the company, if the delivery vans are good, if Amazon still really wants to make this play and compete with Tesla, Amazon could buy them out for like 30 or 40 billion after they crumble to 10 or 20 billion in valuation in six months to a year. So part of me thinks that's how this all may shake out. Huge IPO, crumble, Amazon buyout. Or um, huge IPO, crumble, go to bankruptcy because employees are all like, what's happening? People are getting fired. All our stock options are underwater. Um, or, so those are the two scenarios, which I think are the two most likely, which is kind of lame, but, um, and the, I mean, the third scenario there is the valuation craters, but then they figure it out, they kind of emerge from the ashes, and this is the time you want to invest in Rivian when they, after they've, all the hard part and negativity has been priced into the stock and the valuation is normalized, the risk reward is sort of balanced, um, that could be an excellent time to invest. And then the fourth option is, they just keep crushing it. Like maybe the market gives them so much leeway here and it's all about how much leeway the market gives them. So that's why I would never invest in Rivian at this price. Like you're just betting on what the market, how much, you know, yeah, slack the market's gonna give them and who knows what that's gonna be. So is the market gonna be like, oh, you're worth 80 billion now. You know, as long as you deliver a thousand cars by the end of the year and 10,000 cars next year or 20,000 cars next year, we'll keep your valuation at 80 billion, then 90 billion, and then we'll slowly increase your valuation and let the financials fill back fill in and let you hit billions of revenue. Um, but I don't know, I just, I keep coming back to the fact that Rivian is so far away from even hitting five billion in revenue, years away. And even at five billion in revenue, they're not gonna be profitable, not even close to profitable. So where's the upside here that you're buying? Like, you're, and yes, Rivian says they're TAM, their addressable market's like $9 trillion or $1 trillion because, you know, because they're building electric vehicles. There's 90 million cars sold a year. If Rivian gets a big chunk of that, they could be huge. But what's the risk reward? To me, the risk reward makes no sense. I, if I had to pick a valuation to invest in Rivian, um, I don't know, I'm kind of broke, honestly, so I wouldn't, I don't really have any money to invest in Rivian, but if I did, what valuation would start to get attractive to me? Five billion? four billion, three billion, because then it's like, there's actually upside if they succeed. Like I think 80 billion is like them succeeding. Like if you're already buying at 80 billion, like where's the upside? Um, and just so much could go wrong. But the problem is if they're only worth three to four billion, how do they raise the 10 billion to get there? So this is gonna be an incredible case study follow. I can't wait to keep covering on the channel. I mean, we're all gonna learn so much from watching this go down. And genuinely, even though I'm a little bit bearish on Rivian, like I think what they're doing is just, that's just me on the stock. Like me on the company, like a bunch of my friends work there. Seems like a dope place to work. Um, they have a really cool pro like vision to make these awesome adventure vehicle products. I think they can make an, a rally car eventually. They can make an electric mountain bike eventually. Like they can just really own this adventure vehicle niche and be an amazing company around that. Um, and they're just gonna transition a lot of the world to electric. They're pushing all these other companies to go electric um, by, you know, no, it's not just Tesla anymore. It'll be Rivian, it'll be Lucid. So I think that's a huge thing for hyper-changing our transportation system. And I love that part of what we're seeing here and how excited, and like the fact that investors are valuing this company at $80 billion and they're so stoked to just invest in anything electric because they know it's the future, like that's a great sign. Um, I hope this doesn't fail and then ruin that enthusiasm. But I think it's all coming down from, frankly, Tesla's success. Tesla succeeded. They're a category defining company. They're incredible at building cars. They've revolutionized the manufacturing technology. They've revolutionized the electric you know, battery technology. They've revolutionized the self-driving car software technology. Those are so many different layers of innovation that have taken Tesla, the world's best engineers, decades to achieve. Um, the incredible founder of Elon Musk, like, you know, I don't think Rivian should be getting all of the credit for Tesla's success, and right now they are. So, but I'm wishing them the best of luck, and I think, um, yeah, they definitely have a chance to succeed. So I can't wait to keep following. Let me know what you think in the comments below. What'd you think about this? What'd you find in the IPO S1 filing? Um, leave it below, we'll keep scheming. Anyway, this is Hyper Change. See y'all next time. Peace.